Oh, thank you, worship team. That was great. Um, I've got five pictures to show you before I get into my sermon, and it's directly connected to uh, the trip. Most four of them are directly ch- connected to the trip that the team took to Turkey, and some follow-up of things that are happening that I just thought, you know what, this is such good stuff to show. But I want to show you just one picture that encapsulates uh, the trip that at the same time Andrew and I were doing in Congo. Uh, this was the highlight of the trip in Congo, the head ophthalmologist, that means the eye surgeon for the region of five and a half million people that we were working in, he came in with broken eyeglasses the day he came to license us to get our license to hand out glasses. And uh, within five minutes, we had made him glasses. He had just taped up together glasses that he was going to do surgery with later on that day. And he said he was a month away from getting new glasses. Five minutes later, he's like, these are better than my old ones. And then I cleaned both. And he's like, oh, they're the same. Um, here's the highlight of what happened this week that was a shock to my team. They had another meeting with the ophthalmolo- head ophthalmologist. It went extremely well on Tuesday, so January 2nd. Um, the deal that they made with is they've been selling the glasses for about 8 to $10 per pair to the poor of the community. And the head ophthalmologist said, you know what, we, we appreciate, we want you to do what you're doing, we, we, we want you to continue what you're doing, but we have 2,500 glasses, and they said, we have no access to our office workers working in the Ministry of Health. Can you please stop selling to the poor just for now so that our clerks, our nurses, our, 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 the people who are working in the hospitals get first access? So they've now set up a permanent clinic, get this, in the hospital, selling the glasses to the people in the hospital. So they set this up on Wednesday. On Thursday, in walks in some very stern-looking, not meaning to, uh, security officers with the intelligence agency, and they go to our project manager, Paul, and says, we need to see you guys right away. Come with us into the car. And they're like, what? So it's sort of like, you know, U.S., the CIA shows up, we need to speak to you now. That's a little bit intimidating. They're like, they brought them to their office, which was a couple of blocks away. They said, the Ministry of Health told us about your eyeglass project. Our clerks, our workers, they have no access. We need you to sell glasses to them. And they made an agreement right then and there that they were going to sell them. And the, this was the government's idea. They said, can you sell us glasses for $20 a pair? And they're like, Well, if we have to. So that's how God is working in ways we never expected. And it all started with the exact right person at the exact right time with a broken pair of glasses because God is on the move. So I want to show these next pictures, though, of what Muafak has been up to. Muafak has been hard at work in a... (laughs) You know what? He never ceases to amaze me. Muafak, you never cease to amaze me. Every day he sends me pictures of people that he's been making glasses for. So the team brought um, 360 pair of glasses. Uh, 60 of them were distance glasses. He's since handed out 45 distance glasses and he's lost track of reading glasses. Um, we're going to have to resupply him. He's only down to 15 pair left. But this is just a great example of some of the people that he's given glasses to. I, I just thought that was such a good looking picture. If you can go to the next one. This one is my highlight. This is the one that's actually made the International Agency for Prevention of Blindness. That's the the UN's wing to get glasses out to the world's poor. This was a young lady in her early 20s, came in. She could see only line 3 out of 11 on the eye chart. She was brought in by her dad. Ten minutes later, she saw well enough to pass the North American driver's test for a class 1 driver's license. Dad was just bawling. She just stood there like, and it was just amazing. If you can go to the next slide. This is Muafak with some of our workers in the, in the, in the, that, that are on the worship team together. He noticed one of the young men that plays guitar squinted a lot when he was trying to look out at the audience. He's like, you know what? I should test you for glasses. Sure enough, he needed glasses. If you go to the next one. And this one is my last one, my highlights. This is the best. Muafak told me that he had made this woman a pair of reading glasses plus one, just like what I'm wearing right now, and he felt compelled to give her uh, a, a Gospel of John booklet, which she willingly took and started reading. And then she looked up from the book, and just like me, she could see distance clearly because she needed the exact same prescription for reading as distance. And she's like, wow. God is at work. Isn't that 
amazing. So those are some of the stories you're going to hear later on back here in the sanctuary after we eat a uh, Turkish soup that I know they were working on and I'm looking forward to eating it. I, I, I smelled it when I came into the kitchen, so I promise I'll try not to be too long with the message today, right? Okay. Amen. Yeah. Coming from the wise old preacher, right? <laughs> oh, well, actually, I start off with a saying. A wise old preacher once said, there is culture, there is tradition, but our goal as a church is to find out what is biblical and apply that to our lives. And the wise old preacher's name is Russ Toes. I called him to get permission to quote him this week, and guess what? He didn't remember saying it at all. He said, yeah, yeah, I'm getting old. And yeah, that seems like something I would have said. Well, I actually heard Russ say it right here in this church about eight years ago. We were hosting a study conference for the MB conference. And in a small group discussion, he said that. And he said, that's our goal as we're trying to discern truth and find truth. We had a great discussion for about half an hour on what some of those things might be and how this simplistic but profound statement is also extremely hard to figure out on our own. Because we live in culture and tradition, it's the air that we breathe. The only way to truly figure out this wrestling point of what is truth and what is biblical is to do it in community. I will give you Russ's so now what as part of my message at the end. So now, we're in the book of Acts, part two in the series. The first third really was about the church and the surrounding area of Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, the people who were historically part of the people of God. Yes, the Samaritans were historically part of the people of God as well. They were part of the ten tribes that were quote-unquote lost. They still all followed the dietary laws of, of the Jewish tradition. Uh, the Samaritans, I'll talk more about them later on, uh, they, they only followed the books of Moses. They didn't follow the prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah. But these were people, if you looked at and said, that's culturally the people of God. That's where the gospel has gone only to this point. Yes, there were some converts from outside, but they would have been people who first converted to Judaism followed all the dietary laws. If they were a male, they would have been circumcised. They were brought into the Jewish people, even if they had been culturally, historically Gentiles before, but they had chose to be part of the historical people of God. Now, from the rest of this book on, we will see how the gospel goes out to the world, to the Gentiles, in a way that is simply mind-blowing, mind-boggling to anybody that was around at that time in history. We're in the book of Acts, and we need to also ask three questions when we're reading the book of Acts. And if we don't ask these three questions, we will become confused on how to apply it. Here's the three questions that we're asking. When we read it, are we reading what is a description of a historical event? Are we reading what is a promise, or are we reading what is a command? If you don't understand the difference between these, you will often come up with the wrong application and often, even worse, totally miss the point of the passage. Now, I'm here to tell you there are much smarter scholars than I am. And they state that most of the books of, the book of Acts is a historical description that is mixed with promises and has very few direct commands. Now, do not draw the wrong conclusion from that statement. That makes it sound like somehow you thinking that this is mostly a description of historical events makes the book of Acts unimportant. If that were the case, you could make the same mistake with the books of Matthew, Mark, and Luke because they're very similar in the Gospels. Much of it are historical events that are being presented on how they happened, interspersed with promises and commands. Here's an example where we could go wrong if we didn't do this right in the book of Acts. During the first two to four years of the early church, they lived financially in community. They shared all their financial needs in common. Groups like the Hutterites have taken this a command on how to live. And in fact, this is simply a description of how the early church applied the command at that moment as the church was a brand new in its infancy on how to take care of the widows, the orphans, and the poor that Jesus had commanded them to do. So we are going to try to strive through to figure out 
how do we take those applications of how the early church applied truth and apply that to us here in Westwood in 2023? One of the most important parts of the book of Acts is not humans who lead, and also the most important thing of the book of Acts is not about how it's human-led, but it's how it's spirit-led. Oh, that is a complicated thing for us to get our heads around. Because you and I, we see each other, right? But it's the Holy Spirit that leads us. And the book of Acts describes on how the Holy Spirit led the early church. And we can learn a lot from that. Now we're jumping into chapters 11 to 28 over the next few months. This is the story of how the gospel leaves Judah and Samaria, comes to Syria first, Turkey, into Greece, and eventually Rome. It's actually interesting we're sharing about Turkey today because that's where the gospel is going to go very soon. The book of Acts tells us how the gospel message came to the most important and influential cities in the Roman Empire and how and why Paul was on trial eventually before the Roman Empire. We're going to read now from Acts chapter 11, and I'm going to focus on that first half, because the second half is really the introduction to next week's sermon. So Ernie, if you could come up and read the passage for us. By the way, in your pews, we have Bibles. Um, You can follow along. I encourage you to do so. Yes, we have it on the overhead, and I've made the mistake before of saying it's page this. Well, we actually have two copies. Uh, One is like this one. Uh, the, the large print, which I'm getting old, I need that. And then there's the one that's like finer print that you at sitting towards the back of the church, you're the ones that end up getting the finer print ones. So, Ernie. Acts chapter 11. <clears throat> the apostles and the believers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him and said, You went into the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them. Starting from the beginning, Peter told them the whole story. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. I saw something like a large sheet being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to where I was. I looked into it and saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, reptiles, and birds. And then I heard a voice telling me, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. I replied, Surely not, Lord. Nothing impure or unclean has ever entered my mouth. The voice spoke from heaven a second time, Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and then it was all pulled up to heaven again. Right then, three men who had been sent to me from Caesarea stopped at the house where I was staying. The Spirit told me to have no hesitation about going with them. These six brothers also went with me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen an angel appear in his house and say, Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He will bring you a message through which you and all your household will be saved. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as he had come on us at the beginning. And then I remembered what the Lord had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave them the same gift he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I, Who was I to think that I could stand in God's way? When they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God, saying, So then, even to Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. Now those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word only among Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. And when he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, 
He was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Paul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. During this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, named Agabus, stood up and through the Spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. This happened during the reign of Claudius. The disciples, as each one was able, decided to provide help for the brothers and sisters living in Judea. This they did sending their gift to the elders by Barnabas and Paul, Saul. Thank you so much, Ernie. The first half of this passage is the conclusion story where Peter receives a vision that he's to do two things that are totally against his better judgment, totally countercultural to anything a good Jew would do in the first century. He was told it was now acceptable to eat non-kosher foods, and he could eat it with any person. Now, this doesn't sound like something radical to us today, but it certainly was radical for Peter. We all know the Jews had very strict dietary laws that come from the books of Moses. They didn't eat pork or shellfish, and more importantly is they never ate with a non-believer. Up to this point, as I mentioned before, only the only non-Jews to enter into church had converted to Judaism. And as I said before, the Samaritans would have followed the same dietary laws that the Jews had followed. So the church, while it was a radical statement to bring the the Samaritans and the Jews together and worship Jesus Christ as one Lord and one Savior, this was a whole different matter. Matter of fact, it doesn't mention who the person that Peter ate with in this chapter. If you look back, though, he, the, the person he ate with and ate in his house with was a tanner of hides. That means his house was extra unclean. What Peter does is entirely different and outside of anything he would have thought. Not only did he go into a home with a family that didn't eat kosher, He ate their non-kosher food himself, and he told them about Jesus as the Savior of the world, and they accepted. Here's the most shocking part. And when they accepted, they received the gift of the Holy Spirit. Peter says in verse 15, as he's explaining this to the other leaders in Jerusalem, As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as they had come upon us at the beginning. Think about that. That's amazing. Then I remembered what the Lord had said. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave them the same gift as he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think I could stand in God's way? Wow, that is a life verse right there. Who was I to think I could stand in God's way? I love that. Peter, who was the self-centered Stick your foot in your mouth, know it all during the ministry of Jesus is a completely different man in the book of Acts. Luke is not flattering about Peter in the book of Luke, but Peter, in his own book, that he's the, well, not the author, the the storyteller behind in Mark, is extra hard on him. Now this is a man in the process of transformation. Now we will see in a few chapters, he still messes up from time to time. But what a different person. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is alive and at work in him and he's humble. Instead of standing in God's way, he can't wait to get on with doing the work of God. He also knew practically what it was like to have the Holy Spirit come into him and how he's transformed. How could he stop somebody else from receiving this gift just because they were outsiders? I'll talk about the Holy Spirit more now in my so now what. Let's move on to verse 18, which is my keystone verse for this passage. 
When they heard this, they had no further objections, praising God, saying, So then, even to Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. You might say, whoa, that other verse, that's, that's more powerful. What do you mean? You know, who was I to think I could stand in God's way? I, I would like to make the argument that this is even more radical what's said here. Religious people who are steeped in tradition are not known to accept good things even when it's obviously good because it's against their tradition. Now I want to share a story that I'm not meaning to throw my previous experience under the bus, but here's a story that of well-meaning good people who I love. They had a massive problem when new people who were outsiders came into the church and they didn't stop smoking tobacco. Now these same people were utterly transformed. They had gone to drug rehab on their own. They had stopped drinking alcohol. They had gotten married to their long-term partner. They left a life of crime. They became agents of peace in their extended family, eventually leading many of them to the Lord. But they still smoked tobacco. Now, we can be too quick to be too hard on them. But we all do the same type of thing, that we have things that get in our way. Isn't it wonderful that the God-fearing leaders of the church had this type of attitude? Who praised God said, even then, so then, even to Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. It's easier to see those stumbling blocks in other people's lives and laugh at it. What are we doing that are getting in the way of others finding repentance that leads to life? Now, First, I want to talk about what it means to be a follower of Jesus. See, I'm often in danger of going down the path that I'm the most used to and most comfortable with. I, I'm, I'm built with head knowledge that I love facts. That's why I love to watch YouTube videos on history or, or, or science. I love facts. And the fact of the matter is, it is important to have head knowledge of understanding who is Jesus. Because if we don't have those facts we can't understand what we're saying yes to. But I don't want to stay in this too long. But I still think it's important that we have these facts of saying, what is it that the early church is saying? This is who Jesus is, and this is what the work of the cross did. First of all, we need to acknowledge as a church, as an individual, that Jesus really did live, die, and rise again. That he really was God in the flesh. He's the creator. Now, the danger lies in that it stays there only in head knowledge and that we acknowledge something that we say is truth, but it doesn't change our hearts and we never make Jesus the one in charge of our lives. Putting Jesus in charge is the heart knowledge. It's saying, I fall short and me being in charge of my life has only led to destruction. It's saying, God, you need to take charge. A traditional way of saying this is to say, Jesus, you are Lord. I want to talk about another word that makes no comment, no sense in our modern culture because we don't understand it right because of what culture and tradition have said about this word. And that is the word repentance. Repentance is knowing that there's something wrong and you need to repent and turn from it, to turn away, to say, I'm mistaken and I need to fix it. You see, if there's no repentance in your life, there's no salvation that leads to life like the verse we just read. One of the things that I hear all the time in our culture is, I did this or that, I think this or that way because I was born that way and that makes it okay. Well, I was born an egotistical, self-centered narcissist who gets angry easily, as has everyone else. It's a myth that we were created perfect. That's a myth that we hear in our society. Everybody's innocent. No, actually, that's not the way it is. You want to see the most egotistical, self-centered person? Look at a baby. Right? Okay, please don't hear me I'm not talking about worm theology. I've said that before. I'm not talking about a a baby um, 
you know, having no value and you having no value. I'm just pointing out a fact. There's something broken in us. I wake up every day first and foremost thinking about me. Not you. Not what I can do for the world. Not how I need to uh, be an agent of peace and change. I think about me. And I have to repent of that and say, no, wait. It's about you, God. Here's another cultural idea that our modern philosophy teaches, that there is no bad people, only bad choices. That we're all born inherently good, and all we need for a better society is better education and better opportunities, and we'll solve all the problems of society. (laughs) Now, now don't hear me saying that doing justice and mercy are unimportant. I I, I think that's critically important. That's why I, I do the ministries that I'm involved in. But if we believe that just getting the right education everyone will naturally choose to be good is simply not a reality. You don't believe me? In the eyes of Vladimir Putin and his allies, who are the good guys? They are, not us. But they're the ones who are actually daily committing war crimes against civilians. How can they see themselves as the good guys? Because they're blinded from reality. So that makes us the good guys, right? Oh, hold on again there. How have we, as a society, treated First Nations? What is our long history of racism and misogamy, and how does that show up in our culture? Oh, that was the past. We've arrived now. Our modern sensibilities and enlightenment have overcome our past mistakes. Right. Or maybe we're just blind for what's going on. The only way to live a life to the full is to acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. And what is the result of life to live to the full? Well, Peter, humility, these early believers who after their cultural world was shocked, what did they say? Isn't it great that salvation could come to the Gentiles as well? Humility says this, I am not better than you. It allows us to see us for who we really are as well as others around us. People, every single one of us are made in the image of God and therefore have such incredible value. But because we're tainted by sin, we're all lost, messed up sinners. The difference between Christians and the rest of the world is we know that we're lost and messed up and it's the Holy Spirit who resides in us that does the transformation. That's exactly what we saw in Peter. The Holy Spirit needs to change us day by day to be more and more in the image of Jesus. Again, that's what we see with Peter. This is a lifelong journey that's done only in a community with humility. And when that happens, we're changed and we live a life that is to the full. And none of this can happen without repentance. So in this second week of 2023, I want to tell you, repentance, that one time, first time that we understand this concept of repentance, and that day by day, hour by hour repentance. Yeah, God, I messed up again. I'm glad that you're Lord. Repentance comes when we confess our sin to God and to others. Last week, the old Pope, Pope Benedict, died. And I want to make it clear, I do not agree with everything about popes or whatever, but I want to tell you I have a lot of respect for the last three popes who have lived in the last 30 years. I respect when I heard on the news that Pope Benedict, when he was elected pope, wept. He did not want the job. He said in an interview right after he resigned as pope 10 years ago, he had never wanted the job and all he really wanted to do was retire to a nice study and read the Bible and write about the life of Jesus. That's humility. I heard that on Christianity Today's podcast and the author of that podcast that he had just finished listening to on audiobook, Pope Benedict's book called Jesus of Nazareth. He said, what a masterpiece. He studied who Jesus was and wrote, and, and, and you could see that is what he wanted. Francis, the new pope, this is from Christianity Today again, said something similar to Pope Francis of what he looks forward to when he retires. But he wants to do something slightly different. He wants to study the Word of God, 
but he also wants to leave Rome and move to a small monastery in the countryside where his only official task is to hear confessions and tell people that they are forgiven. I love that. I love that. Here's what he said. I want to listen to people as they confess their sins and tell them, you are forgiven. God has forgiven you. Isn't that marvelous? You, that is the beauty of repentance. It's the type of life that says, God, you're not in charge. I live with receiving forgiveness so I can pass it on to others. Our culture and tradition have gotten repentance all wrong. Culture thinks repentance means flogging yourself, hating yourself, feeling guilty when you didn't do enough, that you're just not really good enough. That's what culture thinks of repentance. Have we fallen into the habit of doing the same thing in the church? Is our idea of repentance actually based on a cultural understanding instead of a biblical understanding? I would make the argument that yes, it is. How is that repentance that leads to life if all you feel is guilty about how bad you are and how worthless you are you are and how you haven't done enough? But what does repentance really look like? It looks something a lot more like what the Pope Francis said. You are forgiven, my child. You are forgiven. Repentance that leads to life leads to change in your life. Oh, and that's my so now what? How is repentance going to lead to life in your own life? Well, it leads first to acknowledgement that there's things that we need to repent of and turn around and do differently in 2023. Here's the one that I asked Russ, and I was actually surprised this was his answer when I said, Russ, what do we need to do in 2023? And he said, you know what? One of the ways of repentance that people aren't doing in the church today is they're not getting baptized after being Christians for their whole life or for decades. He said, repentance that leads to life means being obedient. And being obedient can be things like, I haven't chose to publicly declare Jesus as Lord. And I thought that was an interesting one because we had just started talking about having baptism classes and membership classes for our church. It also includes challenging the world's view of not saying anything is bad in somebody's life when they actually are bad. This is actually one of the reasons why our society is struggling more and more with anxiety. We don't actually challenge each other in the things that we know that are hurting each other's lives. Okay, let me give you an example. Gossip and slander are accepted in our society, yet we know it's unbiblical and we continue to let it happen anyway. If you don't believe me, just take five minutes and look at social media. Hatred is unhealthy and more importantly ungodly, yet we don't call it out in society. And society accepts it. You don't believe me? Go on Twitter for two minutes or the comments section of cbc.ca for one minute. Look at the hatred there, yet it's not called out. Pornography is unhealthy and more importantly ungodly, yet it is fully accepted. Don't believe me? Just look around at our media. It is not just saying we're all good that comes with repentance. It also is challenging each other in the church and saying, these are things that God said don't do, and I will help you with the Holy Spirit to not do them in community that lead us to life and life to the full. Well, the last few verses in this chapter lead us on to next week's story, which is the story of the gospel message being spread to the first major city, Gentile city, Antioch, and how Paul enters into the story. And from this point on, well, he's called Saul. Paul is his Roman name, will become the main character. And I look forward to that. So here's my challenge to you at the end of 20, our second sermon in 2023 though, is discover the journey of what it means to live with repentance that leads to life. 
may you also hear. You are forgiven and loved. May you also pass that on to others. And may you be challenged to change the areas of your own life together in community, knowing that the Holy Spirit is at work. I'm going to invite the worship team to come up, and I'm going to bow for a word of prayer. Lord, we enter into 2023 asking the question, are there things that we've been disobedient in? Help us to repent with humility. Help us to celebrate when we see others who repent and walk alongside them with grace and humility ourselves. And thank you that you've come to give us life and life to the full. Thank you for this incredible story of how you've brought the good news to all the earth. Amen.